Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's good to laugh, isn't it? Life is good. Over the past several weeks, as we have made this journey through 1 John, I gave it the theme, unshakable, because God wants us to be able to stand solid in our faith, to stand assured and confident of who we are as the children of God. So he has spent the vast majority of this book talking about the things that we should avoid, that we should hold on to the truth and avoid false teachings. They should stand strong in the gospel and avoid false teachers. Last week, I mentioned that we're making a transition, and we see that transition fully come to light today as we make, we hear from John, not about the things we should avoid, but about who we are, who we are as the people of God in this world. And if we were to ask John, who are we in the world? What did you hear in the text? In this world, we are like Jesus. A few years ago, there was a movement among American Christianity anyway called the What Would Jesus Do? The WWJD movement. People had bracelets. They had T-shirts. They had bumper stickers on their car. WWJD. And that's a great thing. It brings to mind that constant reminder that we are in this world for a purpose, for a reason, to reflect Jesus. The concern I have, and it's not a big concern, but it's a reality, that if all someone is trying to do to conform is to conform their actions, it will fail. Because the truth is that our actions are simply a reflection of what's inside our hearts. And if we don't change the heart, the actions are going to reflect that. We have to church change the heart, and then the actions will reveal Jesus. And so if we were to talk about what is it that stops us, that hinders us from being Jesus in the world, how would you answer? Now, when I ask the question, I want to be quick to to remind you, we're not talking about those who have no faith. If there's no faith, it'll be clearly seen. We're talking about what hinders Christians, people who know Jesus and the gospel, from living like Jesus in the world? Well, if you look at the text, I think you'll be convinced that what John says is the number one reason our Christian walk in the world is hindered is because of fear. And fear is a powerful emotion. Fear is defined as as the response or the emotions that come in light of what we believe is going to be danger or evil or harm or pain. And whether that fear is legitimate or or just the idea that something bad is going to happen, When fear is present, it has its effects on us. One effect is anxiety. You know what anxiety will do to a person? It makes them stand absolutely still. They can't make a decision. Even a good decision they can't make because they're fearful that anything they do will have consequences, negative consequences. And so it stops them from living life. Another response to fear is solitude. You see this in people's lives when they withdraw from society. They live almost like hermits. And it can be all the way to that extreme or uh, just that they withdraw from certain people or certain events because they're fearful. Whichever one, solitude isolates us and leaves us alone inside ourselves. All because of fear. And when fear is present, the ability to be like Jesus, the ability to love people as Jesus loves is taken away from us or at least hindered in great ways. Now, there are two stories I want to share with you that illustrate this very vividly. The first, 1912, you know the story of the Titanic. Titanic hit an iceberg and sunk in two hours and 40 minutes. When the ship began to sink, they launched all the lifeboats. Problem was, there weren't enough lifeboats for all the people on the ship. They had 20 lifeboats. Lifeboats. And the 20 lifeboats were launched, but there's a further complication in that the lifeboats, when they launched them, were not full. They were only partially full, all 20 of them. The ship sank and went under the water at 2.20 in the morning. And I want you to hear what a witness, a survivor said. I saw horror, the horror of its sinking, and I heard even more dreadful the cries of drowning people. Almost everybody had life jackets. They were floating They were holding on to pieces of the wreckage and the debris, and they were crying for help. There were 20 lifeboats out there, not a single one of them full of people. 
And yet only one boat, boat number 14, rode back and chased the screams of terrified dying people and rescued them. Why didn't the other 19 lifeboats engage in rescuing the people that are in the water? It went on for hours because they didn't drown. They said they had life jackets on. Almost every person in the Titanic that drowned died from hypothermia in the cold water. It took hours. And those in the lifeboats listened to their screams and their cries for help and did not respond. You know why? Because of fear. If too many people try to get in the boat, our boat will be swamped. If too many people cling to the sides, it might capsize, and we would die too. So out of fear, they withdrew to their solitude. And in their anxiety, they refused to go help those who were dying. It's important to note that boat number 14 rescued as many people as they could, and every person that got to boat number 14 survived. None of them drowned because there were too many people in the boat. Every one of them survived, but 19 lifeboats let other people die because of fear. Now, a second story. Two years later, 1914, a man named Ernest Shackleton was an explorer, and he put together a crew of 27 explorers, sailors, to set out to explore Antarctica. They set sail on the Endurance, an exploration ship, and they or headed toward the Weddell or Weedle Sea, I don't know exactly how you say it, uh, near Antarctica, and they, their ship, just a few days out of port, got stuck in the ice pack. And the ice pack, of course, is growing and growing. And they were stuck for 10 months in the ice. And then the unthinkable happened. As the ice pack expanded and grew, it began to crush their ship. So these 27 men got on their three lifeboats and sailed to Elephant Island, and watched as their ship was broken into pieces and sank, just like the Titanic had done. They were in the middle of nowhere. Shackleton took five men and left the rest of the 27 crew members on Elephant Island and set out for help. They tracked 800 miles across the ice and found help. And they returned to Elephant Island, and every single crewman survived. There was no mutiny. There was no cannibalism. There, were no, there was no fighting. Everyone was survived. Everyone was rescued after such tremendous circumstances. The crew of the Titanic or the people on the Titanic acted out of fear and failed to love. The crew of the Endurance acted out of love and everyone was saved. What did the Scripture say? Perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Perfect love casts out fear. You think Jesus was fearful? If you're struggling for the answer, the right one is no. <laughs> he wasn't fearful. Jesus did not fear. The Bible, in our text this morning, just a small portion of, of 1 John, twice it says God is love. Two times. And if Jesus is the embodiment of God, then Jesus is the embodiment of love itself. And love, perfect love, casts out all fear. Jesus did not fear. Fear would have moved him to run away. Fear would have moved him to hide. Fear would have moved him to protect himself even at our expense. But perfect love casts out fear. And it was his love that moved him to go to the cross it was his love that moved him to suffer and die so we could have life. And in all that Jesus was doing, he was simply reflecting the heart of his Father. I want you to hear the text one more time. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Do you realize the Father loves you? I mean, you and you and you and you and even me. God loves us. And Jesus coming into this world was motivated by the heart of a father that loves his children. So the question we have to wrestle with is why do we fear? Why do we let fear hinder us from being what John says, 
We are like Jesus in the world. And what are we scared of? I mean, some people, I mean, if we get honest, some people think, well, if I help this needy person and I give them what they need, I won't have what I need. We fear that if we allow God to use us and we love people as he has called us to love them, that we will end up getting the short end of the stick. But didn't you hear what Jesus said in the gospel? Are not two sparrows sold for a penny and yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father knowing it? And the very hairs of your head are numbered. Don't worry, you're worth more than many sparrows. God has pledged himself to take care of you. He has promised you will always have what you need. And we don't have to fear doing without to love people. You see, it's not a legitimate fear. It's a false fear. And yet we let it bind us and hinder us. Jesus never ate a meal without raising his face to heaven and giving thanks to his Father for providing what he was going to eat. Yet how many of us get scared when we go into a restaurant and we don't want to pray and thank God for our food because we're worried about other people around might think of us. And sometimes we're even scared to do it at home. We're embarrassed. Why should we care what other people think about us when we know exactly what God in heaven thinks about us? And then there are those who have never in their life Though they've been a child of God all of our lives, we've never taken the opportunity to share the love of God in Jesus with another individual. We've never witnessed of our faith. Why? Because of fear. Fear. I may say the wrong thing. I don't know enough. They may misunderstand what I say. We get scared, and so instead of overcoming the fear with the grace and gospel of Jesus Christ, we let the fear constrain us and we fail to tell people that God loves them people that Jesus died for on the cross people that God sent Jesus to save we don't tell them about it because we're scared hear what John says we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world we have seen it. We've experienced it. We are to be the ones who testify to it. You know what the word testify is in the Bible, in the old, old Greek, the original? Marturarion. Marturarion. Martyr. To be a martyr is to testify. The martyr testifies. And how many hundreds, even thousands of martyrs march to their deaths singing the praises of Jesus as their Savior? If that was the circumstance, fear may be appropriate. But when's the last time you were asked to die for Jesus in our society? It's back to being embarrassed. We're scared what others will think. And because of fear, we fail to love like Jesus. And yet Jesus is calling us to love as he does to be willing to put ourselves out there and love others like Jesus does, to love others more than ourselves, to be willing to give of ourselves to love them fully as God loves them. There's a story maybe that illustrates it for us. It's, it's an old story. You'll get that idea. Sam, Stanford University, the university hospital. A little girl was dying. Her name was Lisa. Her girl, little girl was dying because she had a disease they did not know how to cure. And yet her brother, who was a five-year-old little boy, had miraculously had the same disease and survived, and the doctors knew that his body had built up the antibodies that his sister needed to be saved. And so the doctor sat down with a five-year-old, you know, parents are there, and explained to him that, that Lisa is going to die, and you had the same disease, and if you would give your blood to her in a transfusion... Lisa would live. Five-year-old thought about it for a minute and said, well, okay, if it'll save Lisa. They set it up, two beds side by side, all the transfusion stuff set up. And the little boy was happy. He looked over at his sister who had been so sick, and as the blood transfusion was going, he saw the color begin to return to her cheeks, and, and she opened her eyes and smiled at him. And he was happy. But then his smile went away. And in a very shaky voice, he looked over at the doctor and said, 
Will I start to die right away? You see, at five years old, he had misunderstood the doctor. At five years old, he thought the way to save his sister was he had to give her all of his blood in order to save her. He misunderstood, but he was willing to love to the point of sacrifice if it would save his sister. The little boy misunderstood, but was willing to love. Jesus did not misunderstand And he was willing to love. When the father said, son, I want you to be savior of my children, he did not misunderstand what the father was asking. Jesus knew the father was asking him to come into this world and give all of his blood. Because he loves us. And when Jesus went to the cross, he gave his all, all of his blood, all of who he was. Why? Because he loves us. Jesus' death on the cross rescues us from sin. But His love in our hearts sets us free to live. To live free of fear. To live life to its fullest. To live like Jesus in this world. May God grant it to us for our sake and for His glory. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord and the life everlasting depart in peace. Amen.